All right. In case you didn't know, it's Palm Sunday. Yeah. Palm Sunday. What a joy. Go with you to Mark uh, chapter 11. <clears throat> we'll begin reading in verse 7. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their clothes on it, and he sat on it. And many spread their clothes on the road, and others cut down leafy branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Then those who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the kingdom of our father David that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And Jesus went into Jerusalem and into the temple. So when he had looked around at all things, as the hour was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Now the next day, when they had come out from Bethany, he was hungry, and seeing from afar a fig tree having leaves, he went to see if perhaps it would find something on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. In response, Jesus said to it, Let no one eat fruit from you ever again. And his disciples heard it. So they came to Jerusalem. Then Jesus went into the temple and began to drive out those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold the doves. And he would not allow anyone to carry wares through the temple. And then he taught saying to them, is it not written my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of thieves. And then the scribes and chief priests heard it and sought how they might destroy him, for they feared him, because all the people were astonished at his teaching. This is a great day. This is a great day. It is called the triumphal entry. It is the king being presented uh, to his people. It is the fulfillment of all of the Old Testament prophecies that said he would come. From the beginning, Genesis 3.15 said it is the seed of the woman who would come to deal with Satan. In Daniel chapter 9, the one who is to come will make reconciliation for sin. In Isaiah 53, he will pay for our sins by his death. He has come, and he has come in exactly the right time, just as the angel Gabriel said to Daniel in Daniel chapter 9, he will come in 173,880 days from the day that Artaxerxes gives the nation of Israel the right to go back and rebuild the city. And he will come, he will come humbly, He will come in peace. He will come riding on a donkey, just as Zechariah said in Zechariah 9.9, 500 years before this event. He has come, and by his coming, we know that our God is faithful, that our God keeps his promises. This is a great day. The crowds are massive in Matthew 21, 9. They they come with him, and they come to see him from all the crowds that were already in the city because this is Passover, and Passover is that time when Jews from all over the world come to Jerusalem to the temple to make sacrifice. So you have the crowds that are already there, and then you have all the crowds that are traveling with him, and his fame is is once again on people's lips because they have just heard that he's raised Lazarus from the dead. So the crowds are excited. They are enthusiastic. uh, There must have been an electricity in the city around this one who is coming, this promised one. So this massive group of people with him and around him, begin to shout and cry out as he begins to enter into the city on a donkey. Hosanna! Hosanna! Save now! Save now! 
Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. He is the son of David. He is the promised Messiah. He is the king. It is a time of great excitement, great joy. But there's something terribly wrong. Terribly wrong. Because this same group of people, or at least many of them, who are crying, save now, acknowledging him as the son of David, the promised Messiah, the king that God has promised, that same group on Friday will be crying, crucify him. Crucify him. With the same zeal that they were crying, Hosanna. Jesus understood. He wasn't surprised. He allowed them to worship him. He accepted their praises, but he understood the problem. He understood the problem in, in, around him and in the temple worship and all that the nation represented at that time. The next morning, after seeing the temple and what was going on in it and calling it a den of thieves, Jesus comes to a fig tree and puts a curse on it. He says, um, no fruit will this tree bear again. There will be no fruit from it. He speaks of that bush, that tree, but in type, in symbol, in picture, and in reality, he is placing a curse on the nation of Israel, on the people in this crowd, and on their false, hypocritical, religious system where the temple has been defiled and merchandisers make profit off the Passover feast. And while he passes judgment on them and on that temple, Luke 19 says he is weeping. He is weeping because Jesus understands the problem in the hearts of these people. Jesus understands the problem with this, what is now a false religion. And Jesus understands what the consequences are going to be for these people. And it breaks his heart. He weeps over them in Luke 19, 41 to 44. Go with me there. Let's just read that section for a minute. Luke 19, and verse, beginning in verse 41. Now as he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, if you had known, even you especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. You have had so much opportunity. You have had so many privileges. You have all that God has offered to you so that you wouldn't miss this event, and you are missing it. For the days will come upon you, verse 43, when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you and close you in on every side and level you and your children within you to the ground. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. Jesus, the morning after the quote-unquote triumphal entry plus places a horrible judgment on the land, on this nation. How did that happen? How did that happen? How did these people who were so excited on Sunday so quickly turn to demand his death on Friday? One verse comes to mind to me every time I think through this. Go with me to Romans chapter 10. Because I think it's here 
we see the summation of the problem. Romans 10 and verse 3. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. This is a condemnation on all religious people, but it's specifically intended for the Jewish people in this context. They are ignorant of God's righteousness. They do not see how holy he is. They seek to establish their own righteousness by their own methods and their own ways. And they fail to submit to the righteousness of God. The Jewish people were so privileged. And yet they are ignorant. God gave them his law. God gave them his revelation through the prophets so that they would understand their sin so that they would understand his holiness, so that they would know how to live, and so that they would know how to love him as he requires. And he gave them a way to approach him. He gave them a way to worship him. It, surround, it was surrounded by a tabernacle and then a temple. It came through a priesthood and a sacrifice of innocent animals. It was by this system of sacrifice that God allowed them to enter into his presence in a limited way but nevertheless into his presence. They were uniquely called as a nation and given this privilege to rightly worship the one true God. The sacrifices were a constant reminder of how horrible their sin was and that they needed an atonement. Someone had to atone for them. And so every time they would make a sacrifice of an innocent animal, it was to tell them of the one that would have to come that would ultimately pay to deal with sin. It was a picture of Jesus, the only one who could provide that atonement by his sacrificial death. So all of God's revelation, all of his law, all of this system of worship in the sacramental Levitical system was all pointed toward Jesus so that they would not be ignorant, so that they would not miss him. But they were willful rejecters. They refused to heed the clear words of God's revelation. They refuse to understand what right worship is. Because that Levitical system, that sacrificial system, had in it things that they were required to do, but it all had to be done from the right heart. It had to be done humbled and broken and understanding that they needed the mercy of their God. That's what the picture was in all of the things that they did. God was holy. They were sinful. They needed his mercy. They needed to come by faith. They needed to trust him in doing the things he called them to do, which pictured his son and all that would happen on the cross. And so, if you look at Mark chapter 7, verse 37. Mark 
here's the problem. Here's what happens as a result of that ignorance. In Matthew 7, verse 6, excuse me, Mark 7, verse 6 through 8. And he answered them, saying, Well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written. Isaiah, 700 years before, is talking about the condition of their hearts now as well as the condition of their hearts then. It is kind of a continual thing in the nation as they move from faithfulness to unfaithfulness over and over again. And Isaiah said, You hypocrites, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, and in vain they worship me, teaching as the doctrines to teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandment of God, you hold the traditions of men, the washings of pitchers and cups and many other such things. In verse 9 he said, All too well you reject the commandment of God that you may keep your traditions. Why? Their hearts are far from them. They, they've ignored the righteousness of God and they've set about to establish their own righteousness. So they've left, they've left their love of God, the love of God that had to come from a heart attitude toward God, and they've turned it into a religion. And how did they do that? Well, they took the commandments of God that should have put them on their knees seeking mercy, and instead they've added to them, they've changed them, they put new things in to make a religion, to make something that they could do, some, some rituals, some ceremonies that they could do so they could think themselves righteous, seeking to establish their own righteousness. That's what religions do. That's what all religions do. Your heart is far from me because you honor me with your lips, but not from the heart. You worship in vain, teaching as doctrines of God, the commandments of man. And therefore, you have refused to submit to my righteousness. That's what Psalm 51 says. Psalm 51, verse 16 and 17. For you do not desire sacrifice, or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. These, O God, you will not despise. The Levitical system was given by God. It was God's way that they were to follow, but it always had to be followed with a right heart with a contrite spirit, with a brokenness, with a sense of your own sinfulness, with a recognition of His holiness. And they had turned it into just rote mechanical activities. And at the same time, they'd made up their own rules and regulations for living, which they thought therefore made them righteous. They had volumes of what to do on the Sabbath and what not to do. Volumes on how to live their lives in every aspect, not from the Lord, but from their rabbis, from rabbinical teaching. And they had treated them with equal weight to the actual commandments of God. So they had a religion of works. They defined what goodness was, and they believed that that definition was what God agreed with. And so they weren't submitting to God. They were simply doing what they thought was right, what they thought would give them righteousness. So now Messiah comes. He comes just as promised. You can't miss him if you know anything about what God has revealed in his scriptures. 
You can't miss him if you spend any time thinking about what he has done, what he has said, who he is. The evidence is overwhelming. But your willful ignorance of God's revelation and your hard-heartedness against him has left you with an inability to recognize him. You cannot see him. And those hard hearts not only denied what God said about his son, his Messiah, but made things up, left out parts and added things. So this one who comes, this Messiah, is now expected not to deal with their sin, not to pay for their sin. Isaiah clearly said that's why he's going to come. Psalms cl clearly says how he's going to die. Daniel said he was going to come and die. But they don't want to hear that. They believe that their Messiah is going to come and fix everything. He's going to come and fix the problem they have with Rome. He's going to come and fix the problem they have with not enough to eat or their health or the other things of life because he's going to start a kingdom and they're going to be the center of it and they're going to receive all the blessings of God. It's the ultimate welfare state, the, the ultimate um, utopia. That's what they expect. They expect a Messiah that will meet all their physical needs. It's inconceivable to them, because of their ignorance, inconceivable that he would die. Inconceivable that he would die at the hands of Rome, who they expected him to overthrow. Even more inconceivable that he would have to die for their sin. Are you kidding me? Us? We're righteous. We're the chosen people. We keep all of the rules and the regulations, or at least we kind of do, mostly. We're righteousness in we're righteous in the in the requirements of the system that we've created. That by the way is all religion. All religion. So there's no need for God's righteousness. They're ignorant of God's righteousness, seeking to establish their own righteousness. They have not submitted to the righteousness of God because there is no need. There's no need. And that since there's no need for God's righteousness because we're already righteous, we surely don't need this one who is bringing God's righteousness to be offered to those who come to him by faith. And there can never be any understanding of a need for his death. Our ignorance is condemning us to eternal judgment. What is the result of missing Messiah? What is the result of being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish your own righteousness and not submitting to the righteousness of God? That crowd that is so excited, so happy, so enthusiastic, so expectant of the one who is coming to fix everything, that crowd is under the judgment of God and today is in hell if they didn't turn to the true Christ at some point. They're cursed. No more blessing, no more purpose, no nothing, nothing in your life to worship God with, nothing of, it's in a sense, eternal value. You are outside of the grace of God because of your ignorance. You have ignored his gift of righteousness. So you are condemned 
to eternal judgment. And so is your religion. And so is your religion. That false, hypocritical system of religion that Jesus said was being practiced in the temple, which is now a den of thieves, that religion will bear no fruit either. No more fruit. It's cursed. The fig tree withered and died. The religion was killed in 70 AD. 40, a little less than 40 years from the cursing. Titus Vespasian, the son of the then Caesar, besieged Jerusalem, finally entered into the city of Jerusalem, and the soldiers of Rome absolutely destroyed the temple, burned it, and tore it down, just as Jesus said, not one stone on top of another is left. Those are big stones. One of the ancient writers said, the Roman soldiers just went crazy. They, the, Vespasian even tried to stop them, and they wouldn't stop. There was a rage that was almost supernatural in their desire to destroy that temple. Listen, when the temple is destroyed, there's no longer a place for sacrifice. If there's no longer a place for sacrifice, there's no longer a need for a priesthood. If there's no longer a need for a priesthood, and a sacrifice in a temple, then there is no religion. There's no religion. Because that was what God had said was the way to me. It's gone. Whatever Jewish people practice today, it is not the biblical Judaism. There's no temple. There's no sacrifice, there's no priesthood, there's no access to God. But beyond that, it always pictured Christ. It always pictured Christ's work. Salvation always came, not by the ritual of the temple, salvation always came by what? By faith. That's, that's what we know about Abraham. Abraham was justified by faith, by believing God. So in a very real sense, Jesus has always been in view in salvation, even in the Levitical sacrificial system. We always were justified by faith. Old Testament saints justified by faith in the Messiah, the promised one, the Lamb of God, the ultimate sacrifice what would come. And us, on this side of the cross, we're justified by faith looking back to the cross and all Jesus accomplished on the cross for those who come by faith and repentance. There's no need any longer for a temple because it's complete. Its purpose in God's economy is finished. It pictured Jesus and he came. So, Jesus is the ultimate sacrifice. No more need for animal sacrifices. Jesus is the high priest. He is the one that ushers us into the presence of God. No more need for a priesthood. He is the one that that whole system foretold, and he came. And so now... Our access is through him because of his sacrifice. That interesting Old Testament system of worship does have really 
profound significance for us, however, in its pictures of our worship. Go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And verse 19. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? Go with me to 1 Peter chapter 7. Peter 7, 9. Is that right? That's not right. 1, 9. I'm sorry. I've got my... I've got a... No. Go with me to Revelation 5. <laughs> Revelation 5, 11. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels around the throne and the living creatures and the elders and the number of them was 10,000 and 10,000 and the Lord, and excuse me, uh, 10,000, 10,000 saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who is slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And I've missed that one. Who makes us a, oh, verse 10. And having made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on earth. Amen. First, in, in Peter he says, we are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people called to proclaim the praises of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. And then in Romans 12, Romans 12. I beseech you, therefore, my brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service of worship. What do all those verses tell you? Well, they'll tell you that the picture of that Old Testament Levitical system, that the reality of that system was a picture of the completion of Christ's work and what we are now given as a privilege in our relationship with him and worship. In other words, we are the temple of God. No longer a brick or stone edifice, but he resides in us. It's the place where the presence of God is and he is in us. So we are the temple. And, and no longer a priesthood, a class of people to bring you to God, but you and I are priests of our God. We bring people to our God. We intercede for others to our God. We minister for our God. We are priests. It's called the priesthood of believers. And then... And then, we're the sacrifice. That's what Paul says in Romans 12. Present your bodies a living sacrifice. That's the picture. Not dead animals. Not dead animals. Your life. Your life. In John 4, 23, the Lord says, we need to worship in spirit and in truth. We need to worship correctly and we need to worship from all of our inward self, from, from who we are at the depths of our being. Not ritualistically, not externally, but from our heart. Same call. We worship in spirit and we worship in truth. Not the way we think we should worship, not the way people tell us to worship. We're to worship based on what he reveals. 
So if we're going to worship in spirit and in truth from the heart, and we are the temple of God and the priesthood of God and the sacrifice of God, then we need to spend some time making sure we are fit. fit. We need to make sure the temple's cleansed, not full of money changers, not filled with hypocrisy, not filled with sin. The temple needs to be cleansed by daily and momentarily, whenever necessary, confession. That's how we deal with that. And we're priests. That means we have a responsibility before God to honor Him in all of the service that we offer up to Him. It's all for His glory, not for our own. And if we're the sacrifice, then we need to be holy. And we need to be devoted. And our lives need to be given fully and completely and totally and always to Him for His glory, for His honor, for His praise. Our thoughts, our words, our motives, our actions, that's what make it a proper sacrifice if we come with that contrite heart, that humble heart, that heart that knows Jesus Christ and is cleansed by His sacrifice and is constantly dealing with sin so that that sacrifice will be honoring to our God. You see, the reality of worship comes from hearts that love the Lord and seek His honor. That's what the crowd at Palm Sunday lacked. They had every opportunity to understand how to do that, every, under, every opportunity to present them rightly to the right Messiah and to the right God in the right way, but they refused. And the reason they refused is they thought they were righteous because they'd created a system that told them they were righteous because they just did stuff. So they praised him with their voices, but their hearts were far from him. And the consequence was judgment. It's frightening in some sense to think that particularly in the professing Christian church today, there are so many that are like the crowd on Palm Sunday. So many that praise Him, even rightly acknowledge who He is. But they're pretenders. Their hearts are not given over to Him. They're not born again. They've never come by faith and repentance. They somehow think they're okay. There could be a lot of reasons why they think they're okay, but whatever they are, it isn't the right reason. They have been ignorant of the righteousness of God. They've sought to establish their own righteousness by going to church and doing Christian things and being a good person, and they have missed the righteousness of God that is veiled only through Jesus by faith and repentance. And I pray there's none of us here in that shape, in that condition. If, if, if any of us are, just, just get right. <laughs> you know, don't, don't, don't try to fool God. Just humble yourself, acknowledge your sin, turn from it, and put your faith and trust in Jesus. Our praise is worthless if it doesn't come from hearts that love Jesus. They missed him, but we haven't. And the joy of Palm Sunday, well, it's a real joy in the sense that God is in view and his amazing faithfulness is in view. And when you look at what Jesus is doing and where he's headed, it's, an, it's a magnificent thing that he's doing. And so it's time to be joyful. But the real joy isn't Palm Sunday, is it? The real joy comes in a few days.
the real joy comes when he comes out of that grave, Amen. conquers death, and makes a way for us. That's where the real joy is, and that's what we're going to celebrate soon. Let's pray. Father, thank you for our time. Thank you for your word. Thank you, Jesus, for who you are, for all you've done. Thank you for coming, for carrying out the plan, for presenting yourself to your people on Palm Sunday. Thank you, Lord, for teaching and giving all the evidence we have that you are who you claim to be. Our hearts cry out for those people that see you and yet miss you, for they condemn themselves. But we see you, Lord, <clears throat> by the eyes of faith that you've given us. We run to the cross. We throw ourselves on your mercy and we rejoice in it. And we proclaim you, Lord, not only your death, but we proclaim your victory and resurrection. And we are joyful beyond expression. Help us to live out that joyful life in a manner that honors you, Lord. Help us to be right living sacrifices. Help us to be the right temple for your spirit. Help us to be responsible priests in your kingdom, representing you as your ambassadors, always for your glory, never for our own. Thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.